like a lot of forks. That's kind of what we figured yeah. out. Um, the uh, Hanover is kind of through that door. That's the Hanover Road along the map, so it really does hang right through the door. Nice. And uh, the map is 30 feet square. Its scale is an inch to 200 feet, which makes it about 13 miles per side. There are 632 miles. You can wander around it. We let you wander around during the during the thing. I gotta and say, it was the, the roads and steels. This was originally a, from a private exhibition. Um, the roads and steels must have painted it in the mid 60s. It just didn't. It, it just didn't stay white very long. Or I'd have lots of people going, oh yeah, I remember when they painted it. Um, perhaps the I'm paying for one. You're paying for one, I can get you some change in a second. Yeah. Yeah. And you're good. Yeah. All right, let me get you cool. some change. Questions, what might happen to it in the future? As a newspaper guy, I gotta say, I hate the expression world famous. Here, the evening center. Yeah. Um, we were an after afternoon paper, which is why we were the evening center. The Baltimore was the morning center. A lot of people got it. Right? The um, told me he thought that this was the most accurate topographic map of the, of the battle. And I thought, well, that's very nice to say, but come on, I've been to the battlefield. And, I don't think Big Round Top looks anything like that. Uh, and he said, well, we, what you gotta understand about a map like this is, it has to be exaggerated to make sense to you. Because of your tiny size relative to the Earth, um, everything is bigger than it really should be so that you can see it on the map. This is the old visitor center where the map was, at the center of the battlefield. Um, this building is actually started its life as a, as a private museum named John Rosensteel. He lived in Emmitsburg, Maryland. He came up the Emmitsburg Road because he heard there was a battle here in Gettysburg. He started wandering around the battlefield. This was on July 5th, so just two days after the end of the battle. Um, still a lot of troops in the area, but he was down in um, Devil's Den. He found himself a sharpshooter's rifle. Okay. Took him home. This is really cool. He hid it under his bed. Nothing bad happened. So out there the next day, maybe a canteen. <laughs> A, uh, you know, some shells, starts to get habit forming after a while. He's out there every day picking stuff off that battlefield. He's arrested twice that we know of by the, uh, by the provost. Uh, the, the, the army thought that was theft of government property, um, but nobody was, you know, there was no shame attached because every farmer in the area was out on that battlefield picking up artifacts. Um, John Rosensteel opened a small museum near um, Little Round Top after the war um, to display his artifacts, but he wasn't near the entrepreneur that his nephew George was, because George bought not only his, um, his uh, uncle's collection, he bought all the collections of um, everybody who lived in the area. So he ended up with 90,000 Civil War artifacts, all from one battle. Mm. That's the Rosensteel collection. There's nothing like it. Um, and no other battle or, or that many pieces um, from one place, all, all in one place. Uh, it's all still at the visitor center. Not very much of it is on display at any given time, uh, but it is quite a collection. And we have the Rosensteels to sort of thank for. But it, it, it was uh, sold by the Park Service in the mid 1970s, so this must be the early 60s, late 50s. Notice it says Gettysburg National Museum Inc., home of the electric map. It's already world famous back then, right? <laughs> When we started looking at that, really, and we started figuring out how it was built, it really was, you know, some, some people have an old car they were storing or something. Well, Joe had his map. Now, he, there was a 10-foot map in the visitor center beforehand. If you remember that old visitor center, remember that circular balcony, you would look at the visitor center, um, was ready. The, um, the park superintendent at the time, a guy named John Latcher, um, he's usually made the bad guy in the story. He once infamously called this the electric nap. <laughs> um, I don't think he wanted to rewrite the uh, narration and bring it up to date. Um, there are some historical inaccuracies in the thing. 
But, um, but he didn't hate the map as much as I think people made it out because the plan originally was to give this map to a group that wanted to start a map museum in downtown Gettysburg at York and Stratton Streets where Lee's Buffet is now. It's, I think, L-I, not L-E-E. Um, it's, it's a Chinese buffet. It's right there. And um, it, um, it, that would have been the map museum. And the idea was to make this the centerpiece. Um, Kurt Musselman was involved in that group. And then there would be other, and like, there's a lot of historic maps that come out of Gettysburg, the Coat map, the Elliott map, um, the Governor K. Warren map that shows where like all the crops were. Um, and then they would maybe have other war kinds of maps. I think it's a great idea if they were to reopen and start a map museum again. Um, the owner of this map. And we were told it's being held in an undisclosed location which is waving red meat to a reporter. You know, I don't know why, it was like a big secret all of a sudden, but it was, and so the Gettysburg Times and the Evening Sun, we were both like, you know, red meat to a reporter or hanging on to this story, as was the Civil War Times and a number of, uh, of uh, national publications. Um, the map became kind of a symbol of, you know, the old way of doing things in Gettysburg, and it was quite a political issue. Well, by 2013, the 150th anniversary is coming up, the new superintendent, a guy named Kirby, um, Superintendent Kirby did not want the map hanging over his head for his big 150th party. So he announced that he would sell it to the, he announced that he would sell it to the, to the highest bidder, sight unseen, and if nobody bid on it, which is what they were thinking, it would go to the landfill and we'd, we'd be done with it. Well, he makes that announcement. I get a call from the owner of this building, Scott Rowland. Um, Mr. Rowland said, what do you think? Should we buy the map? Um, Scott was from out of town. He had just moved here. Um, he'd, made a, he'd made some money in the electrical connector business, interestingly enough. And um, he, ended up, he ended up buying this building. He didn't really want it. But, um, you know, it was for sale. And I think that he ended up paying just the, the outstanding taxes. He got the building for, for nothing. Um, I think, you know, there was $50,000 in tax owed on this building. Something, he paid something like that for it. It's a pretty good sized building. So he had this building and he thought, well, you know, um, Hanover, like a lot of um, small towns, looks for ways to market itself. We are the snack food capital of the world, for example. <laughs> um, we had a battle here on June 30th, 1863, and Scott reminded me because he said, what do you think about the map? And I said, well, we're not Gettysburg. I don't know how, I don't know if it's going to draw people to Hanover. He says, well, we have a battle. We could like to have a map and we could do battle tours and we could call this the Hanover Conference Center. And he had some big dreams for this building. And by the, uh, I, I, made the, I made the comment at one point in that conversation. I said, well, you know, when the Union troops came through Hanover, the, uh, the townspeople were so grateful to see them that they went running out in the street with beer and pretzels. So we were the snack food capital of the world, even in 1863. And he's like, yeah, that's the spirit. We're buying the map. Um, <laughs> I didn't suggest, I said, well, what do you think you pay for it? And he was like, well, I don't know, a few hundred dollars? They're not even showing it to anybody. Who else would, who else would possibly be interested? And I don't know if you've ever been to an auction. The proud owner of this map for like 15000 and change. <laughs> so they take him out to the undisclosed location, which is the uh, truck lot, the truck yard, the Kinsley truck yard north of York on 83. They had four semis backed up, the trailers backed up to like the big uh, Jersey barriers, you know, so that if you cut the locks off the doors, you still couldn't get them open. I have no idea why they have that kind of security for this map. Thinking, the, you know, Neo Confederates are going to come get a little round top at long last. Or, <laughs> um, they were they were really serious about. It. Oh. So anyway, they open the doors and Scott see they're shining flashlights. And Scott looks in, and when they cut this map, they did not unhook anything. They oh, saw okay. through wires. There was wires hanging everywhere. Wow. There was no like switching. All the switching equipment was gone. All he got for his money was the map. And so he looked at that and said, oh my God, I just spent $15,000 on four slabs of plaster with 632 holes drilled in them. <laughs> Maybe we should skip ahead. There's Scott with his four slabs of plaster with 632 holes drilled in them. He looks thrilled. Oh, Doesn't so he look thrilled? Well, he had to tell his wife something, right? 
you know, it was like, oh, this is going to be really cool, honey. Check it out. We're going to have the electric map. And blah, 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 blah. Um, the map came up here, um, and uh, they put it up on Cinderbox. It took, it took Scott and an electrician friend of his about three years to rewire this. It's all done with phone switching equipment today. Um, it, it is wired as four separate pieces, so if it ever has to get moved again, it doesn't have to get all pulled apart and destroyed. That's best um, yeah, I mean, because yeah, <laughs> like Rosensteel built this from scratch, and in a way, I think it's cool that Roland sort of rebuilt it from scratch because, I mean, they, they don't even have a Yellow Pages anymore, but if they did, you would not find electric map repair in it. You won't find that on Google. You just got to, like, figure out how to do it on your own. Look at this building. There's the crane getting ready to take the map through. Oh, there's a piece of map going through. These were shot by the evening sun. There were four, the photographer called me, he's like, oh, sorry, they didn't drop anything, so we don't have anything <laughs> exciting for you. But, but they got it all up here, and, and then, as I said, they spent quite a bit of time putting this, uh, this whole thing together. So we were missing just a few of the lens covers. Those are called pilot's lens covers. Um, they're very hard to find. There's a company in Germany that makes them. We've tracked them down. And we needed like five or six of them. They said, yeah, we don't have a minimum order. You can, you can have five or six. They'll be $90 a piece. Jeez. And we need eight months lead time. Make them for you. So, Scott, when he was a kid, had a Mattel thing maker. He could probably do this on, and we, he actually made some of his own, like, to sort of, and they're, they're bursting there. Almost all of them are the, are the original ones, however. You were located as a senator of one of the most famous faculty in the world, and acted on stage for 20,000 years during the first three days of July 1863. The battle of Gettysburg was one of the most decisive battles in history. During the high tide of the Southern Confederacy, it is considered by many historians the turning point of the American Civil War. Your present position is indicated by the white light on the map. The town of Gettysburg is enormous, about one mile. Note that the map is oriented as marks along its edge. Near the end of June, part of the invading Confederate army passed 25 miles beyond the town of Gettysburg. Now, on July 1st, the whole army led by General Robert E. Lee was converging from the west to the north. General George Gordon Lee, commanding the Northern Army, moved his forces in from the south of Gettysburg. He had been ordered to stay between the invading Confederates and Washington, D.C., the capital. Therefore, when the Battle of Gettysburg started, the northern forces came in from the south, and the southern forces came in from the north and west. The first troops to arrive were Union forces. They came in from the south, passed through the town of Gettysburg, and scattered out in line of battle, leaving two brigades in reserve. The reserve brigades are resting in the cemetery near our present location. Then the Confederates began their attack. First from the west and then from the north. The Confederates advanced and struck the Union line in this fashion. Today, the Eternal Life Peace Memorial stands at about the center of where this July 1st fighting took place. The commander of the Union troops that opened the action, General John Reynolds of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, was killed at this spot, only 52 miles from his home. He was succeeded in command by General Abner Delday. The man who ordered the first shots to be fired from Fort Sumter more than two years earlier, marking the beginning of the tragic civil war. The important thing to note here is that the Confederate line was longer than the Union line. It overlapped the ends of the Union position. The right flank of the Union line and far the Nole, in particular, was in danger. Finally, the right end of the Union line from then the remainder of the Union forces on left and center were dislodged and compelled to fall back along this line. 
The Confederates continued to press the Union men and drove them through the streets of the town of Gettysburg. The Union line continued to fall back until it reached the point where reserve troops were waiting. And then, to their assistance, the cover of the ridge, the retreat was halted and the line reorganized. The Confederates pursued but did not again attack on the evening of the 1st of July. Instead, they were content to reorganize their lines in this manner. And as the campfires began to appear behind the lines the night of July 1st, the two armies occupied these positions. To sum up the first day, the Union forces were driven back to the town of Gettysburg, a distance of nearly two miles, and the retreat ended here, where we are located, on what is called Cemetery Hill. In the meantime, the Confederate commander, General Lee, arrived on the field and made his headquarters here. General Meade, the Union chief, arrived and made his headquarters there. Meade's headquarters is just about 600 yards south of the Center, our present location. During the night, a few additional campfires appeared behind the Confederate line, out along the Chamberburg Road, indicating the approach of the head of Longstreet's stop. Lieutenant General James Longstreet commanded the first corps of the Confederate Army and was a trusted friend and confidant of General Lee. His approach would not have been as consoling to the Confederates if they could have seen a great number of additional campfires springing up in a Union rear, indicating the arrival of many more Union forces. This buildup of Union power took shape throughout the morning of July 2nd. As the campfires leaped out behind the lines, the newly arrived Union troops moved into position along the front. No fighting had occurred during the night of the first or the morning of the second, and that is the appearance of the two lines as they approached the first fight on the second day at Gettysburg. The third corps of the Union Army, under General Daniel Sickles, advanced to a new position ahead of the Union position. When Sickles reached that point, he received word that the Confederates were moving from the West. This was Longstreet moving in. Sickles' line was spread out in this way. An angle was formed in the line of the famous P. Georgia. Along present-day Business Route 15, the end Park Road, the road to Washington. The left of the line rested at a large ledge of rocks called the Devil's Den. Long Street is ready. His men come forward in line of battle from Seminary Ridge. He opens by advancing his right toward the Big Brown Top, a large hill at the southern end of the battle. Big Brown Top is of no immediate importance because it was wood and too rugged for artillery. The small rail to the north, split around top, had recently been cleared of trees. It became a key position at Gettysburg. If the Confederates had occupied this hill, the smaller one, they may well have won victory at Gettysburg because, from the crest, their guns would have put all of the ground between our present location and Little Rock. The man who was sometimes called the savior of Gettysburg, General Gouverneur K. Warren, rode to the hill and realized its importance. When he saw the Confederates coming, he rushed for a gate of 1,300 men to guard. And just as the brigade was positioned, the Confederates struck in this fashion. The one brigade checked them until another arrived. Then the two brigades stopped the Confederate advance and compelled them to fall back into the battle. In the meantime, additional Confederate units were moving in. The Union forces advanced. 
devil then were driven back into the valley of death. The Union forces in front of these Confederates were driven back across the wheat field. Seven Union brigades plunged in and regained the wheat field. Four of these brigades of the same four that were back here. They plunged into the front line as reinforcing units. These Confederates were supported by sharpshooters posted among the rocks in the Devil's Den area. The sharpshooters were picking off the Union men on the little round top, including some of the prominent Union officers on the southern end of the field. Now Longstreet said the remains of his column fall. His entire column was in motion. It had left Seminary Ridge and was pressing towards Cemetery Ridge. Union reserves were quickly pushed in there to plug the hole in the line. General Sickles, commanding the Union left, was at this point when his right leg was nearly torn off by a Confederate ship. The one legged officer outdid all the other corps commanders who fought in the battle. Sickles died in 1940, 51 years after he lost his leg on this field. Once these Confederates continued their advance, they swept through the Peach Orchard and drove the Union line back in this fashion. The Union forces in this sector were driven out, and Long's Peach troops moved into the wheat field, fought their way through the wheat field into the Valley of Death, and launched another assault on the Little Round Town. But again, they were stopped. And they bumped into that little hill. The farthest advance of that particular portion of Long's Beach column is marked by the little stream in the valley of Death, which became known as Bloody Run. In the meantime, the left of the attacking column, part of A.C. Hill's corps, had swept the Union line back to Cemetery Ridge. They were stopped because of that ridge. And because the Union reserves, many of them from the right of the line, were rushed forward. They went into line of battle along the ridge, bolstering the line, stopping Hill's advance, and compelling them to turn back. The right wing withdrew first. Then Union troops struck the center to the edge of the wheat field, where they stopped. The wheat field stood between the two lines, now a bloody no man's land. This little bean line indicates the location of a portion of the first Minnesota Regiment. During the action of the Beatles Cover, this one regiment attacked and stopped two brigades, but lost almost 70% of its men in the most of the losses were suffered in about 15 minutes. The Confederates in that sector were in open fields. With the advance stopped, they couldn't stay out in the open, so they fell back, first along the sun, and then back to the protection of Seminary Ridge. These Confederates on the right stayed in their advance position. They were protected by trees and rocks. That ended the fighting on the southern end of the field during the second day. We moved down to Cox Hill, the right flank of the Union Army. We are here. Cox Hill is three quarters of a mile east of this visitor center. Spanger Spring is located at the base of that hill. Most of the Union troops on Cox Hill had been withdrawn. They were among the troops that went out to help stop Longstreet, leaving just this one brigade to guard David. The evening of July 2nd, three Confederate brigades moved against one Union brigade, fighting by 
behind rock and log barricades. The Northern soldiers could not be dislodged. But the Confederates found light resistance on the south slope of it. They moved into the empty trenches of the withdrawn Union troops. And then the Confederates stopped. One could ask, why did they stop? They had moved against the hill late in the evening, and the fog of darkness hampered their movement over unfamiliar ground. Also in those days, communication was depended on daylight. Somebody on foot or on horseback carrying the men. And who? They were afraid the Union forces might be retiring deliberately, baiting them into a trap. Uncertain, they decided to wait until daylight. During the night, the Confederates were reinforced by four brigades. But the cause of the battle was big. It gave the Union officers time to return all their troops and to add reinforcements. On the morning of July 3rd, the last day of Pittsburgh, the Union position was too strong and the Confederates lost their chance. The battle at Cox Hill was renewed about 4 in the morning on the third day. They hammered each other for seven hours in what some call the bloodiest fighting of the war. About 11 o'clock, the Confederate officers realizing that the waste of life to continue the conflict, ordered their men to withdraw, and in breaking off the engagement, ended the threat to the Union last night. That brings us to Longstreet's assault, popularly known as Pickett's Charge considered by some the turning point in the four-year American Civil War. The attack occurred in the afternoon of the last day at Gettysburg. The Confederates withdrew from Cuxville at 11 in the morning. From 11 until 1 in the afternoon, the scene was quiet. Lee was preparing the stage for one of the greatest infantry charges of history. Me, anticipating that another assault would be made, was preparing to repulse. They were juggling positions. Finally, the two armies were in position along these lines. Lee maneuvered nearly 12,000 men into line of battle. Keep in mind that Lee are located here. The center of the Union line became known as the High Water Mark making the high ground of the Confederacy, the high point of a Confederate military achievement. After Gettysburg, the tide of the Confederacy would be seen. The Union center was separated from the Confederate attacking column by almost a mile stretch of open fields. 12,000 men were going to cross those open fields. Longstreet was here. He doubted his chance of success. But Lee knew they were running low on supplies on an unfriendly soil. And must have the victory, which had seemed so close in the last two days. He decided that the game would be worth the risk. Some 150 cannons on Seminary Ridge opened fire upon the Union Center. Many of the trees in the grove at the corner of this building were black as the splinters. A few minutes later, over 100 Union guns here along the Cemetery Ridge answered. For two hours, the hills shook during the thunderous garage. Then the Union officers, believing that the assault would soon fall, ordered their guns to stop firing in order to prepare for it. The Confederate officers, knowing the break of Union fire, thought that the Union line would demoralize. A reluctant knock from Longstreet was a signal that sent 12,000 men, rank upon rank, with banners waving, marching across open fields. They didn't rush at first, they marched. The Union 
his guns were stopped. Wait. And then suddenly the 12,000 men discovered they were facing a roaring volcano. The Union guns had reopened. The Confederates continued marching until they reached this point. Then they halted, reorganized, and rushed in the face of cannon loaded with cannon, like giant shotgun shells. Still they came. Finally, blood enough brown uniform melted with blue in a bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. The lines became entangled. Thus did the divided nation drain its own white blood. Brothers fighting brothers. Each for the cause. He thought was right. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. And the greatest enemy charge in our history was history. Of the 12,000 men who started the charge, over half did not come back. In Pickett's division alone, all but three of the field officers were dead or wounded, including three generals. Entire regiments disappeared. Fewer than 1,000 picked soldiers answered the next morning's roll call. Note that the Confederate attack was split into two columns. The main column here. The smaller column, confused by the smoke, attacked slightly to the south. Two Union regiments, consisting of troops from the state of Vermont, carried the advance into the gap created in the Confederate lines. They wheeled to the right, facing north, and raked the flank of a larger Confederate column. Men of the modern did an about face, fired some, and tore up the flank of a smaller column. These two small regiments effectively demoralized the flanks of Longstreet's two columns. Confederates fell back to seminary. The final maneuver at Gettysburg occurred five miles east of the main battle. Several brigades of Union cavalry under General David M. Gregg were patrolling those fields. One of these brigades was commanded by a 24 year old Brigadier General, George Armstrong Cutt who would later make a last stand against the Sioux Indians in Montana. Back to the little Leeward. Leeward is the famous Confederate cavalryman, Jeff Stewart, who would come on the field from the north. To swing around the Union front, to a position behind the Union army, to have his cavalry in position behind the Union lines when Pickett's troops broke through. They were then being infantry in front, cavalry poised in the rear. Lee intended to use his cavalry to protect the Union route once Pickett broke through. But Stuart ran into trouble. When he reached this area, he was spotted. He came into the line of battle to find the two Union brigades blocking his front. He sent for his first unit of snipers and skirmishers. One of the Confederate brigades ran out of ammunition and was compelled to withdraw. The remainder of the Confederates advanced and were caught. The Union troops were firing on them from three different angles. Stewart, hammered in the movement, ordered the Confederates to withdraw. He left the field to the two Union brigades and returned. The last Confederate thrust at Gettysburg had been made. The high water mark had been reached. Though the war would bleed on for two more years, the Confederate cause, for which her sons had fought so bravely, was doomed. The following day, July 4th, the two armies sat, facing each other, nursing their wounds. During the 
evening of July 4th, it was pouring rain, which months of the traffic had moved. Lee, Longstreet, Ewell, Hill, Stewart, the entire Confederate Army started the withdrawal that ended the bloody event to ever take place on the American continent. 51,000 soldiers, American law. 30% of the arms and law were casualties in the three days of their fight. We direct your attention to the shape of the Union line, the famous fishbook formation at Desert. If you keep a picture of the fishbook in your mind, you can better understand the battlefield between the major two. We are located where the hook begins to bend. It bends through the National Cemetery, back over Cross Hill, with the point of the hook near Spangler Spring. The shank, or long end of the hook, begins here at the visitor center and follows south along the crest of Cemetery Ridge, past the High Water Mark, the Mont Monument, Pennsylvania Monument, Minnesota Monument. Little Round Top and end at Big Round Top. Keep this in mind. You can keep your directions in order as you tour the battlefield. Four and a half months after the battle, on the evening of November 18th, President Abraham Lincoln came to Gettysburg for the dedication of the Gettysburg National Cemetery. Now, with the armies far away in Virginia, the lights of the town and farmhouses burned throughout the countryside. The president spent the night at the David Will residence. Here he completed the final draft for the speech he was to deliver the following day. The next morning, November 19, 1863, as the few thousand people that were to share in one of the biggest events of history were gathering on the streets of this little town, they then emerged, mounted a horse, and rode to the cemetery, used the road that passes in front of this building. Amid the neat rows of freshly dug graves and a few carefully chosen phrases of dedication, he defined for all Americans the lesson of so much pleasure. The world, he said, can never forget what they did here. It is for us to highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Piece of history. If <laughs> anybody wants a photo of that, yeah. come around. It was originally for that anyway. Don't eat the map, that's all. <laughs> um, and second, you'll notice there are some lights that aren't on. Um, I think we've actually had two burnouts since we, uh, we uh, reopened the map, but um, most of them are because you heard, the, you heard the presentation. We don't know what, like this is South Cavalry Field down here. It's not mentioned, so we had no idea what to do with the lights. Maybe get a you know. Um, same is true of Powers Hill, and this is the one that, that uh, how nobody was talking about Powers Hill in 1963. It was private land. Um, it, had, it was treated over. Uh, a few people knew there were some monuments up there, but that's about it. 
Uh, Park Service buys it 15 years ago, 10 years ago now, and clear cuts one side of it. Now, Powers Hill is super important. Everybody looks at Powers Hill, talks about how really that's that's the barb of the hook, if you will. Right down here, you got a Union gun line up on this hill. Um, it's on this map, though.